today to Bilston Church family. It's nice to be again um, with you all. I am Farida. Today I will be introducing my own husband, Clay Gooden, <laughs> who will be taking um, the defined part of the service and share from God's word with you today. I hope that we all had a blessed week, even if it's the smallest blessing, we should appreciate them so that we can appreciate the big blessings as well. Um, so I hope that at least you can think of one thing that God has done for you today that you did not expect, or maybe you did expect it, but you appreciate it. Um, reason to appreciate him again um, every day. Also, we have with us today who's watching, sitting next to me, Israel, our son. Um, and as you can hear in the background, we have a bird, a budgie. So he's making quite some sounds. Sorry about that. Um, but um, I hope that as you join us in the rest of this worship service this afternoon, this morning afternoon, that uh, yeah, you may be blessed and leave equally with a blessing as well today. Ah, also on another note, let me introduce my husband properly. <laughs> Craig is a, um, as I would describe him, very kind-hearted, friendly person who's always willing to support uh, or help others, and a passion, passionate love for God, which is what I admire most about him. Because it's as a wife, it, it's nice to see, heartwarming rather to see when your husband loves God, because there's no doubt then that he'll love me. So that's what I would leave you with today. Thank you. Apologies. At this time, we will now um, have a intercessory prayer. So if you, where possible, take a, a position of reverence as we talk with our maker. Let us bow our heads. God, we thank you and call on your name. We glory in you, our God, our strength. You have told us to continue to seek your presence, and we do that now. You have told us to remember the wondrous works that you have done for us, and we do that now. You are a God that is like none other. You never promise what you will not keep. You never fail regardless of how small or insignificant it might appear. You have purchased us, you have loved us, and this is shown by the way your son was sent for us. And we give you all the glory at this time. Lord, we know and we thank you that you are a God of peace. We thank you that even in these trembling and challenging times, we can still be known by you. And we know that nothing can separate us. We praise you for your protection and your favor that has been of, with us these past few months and weeks. And now as we come together, to worship you this Sabbath day, we know that we will give you all the honor and all the praise. Lord in heaven, we know that at times we fail you, we doubt you, we sin against you, and we'd ask for your forgiveness this morning. Lord, we are constantly in awe of your grace towards us. Lord, as we come together, we now ask that you will prepare our hearts for the message that we'll, we will receive. We have been looking and at ourselves as a family and seen the importance of the family. So we would ask for your watchful eye over us, encourage us, give us the wisdom, give us the love we need as we 
seek to support one another, both as in our individual families, but in the church family. So this morning, we ask that you'll bless this church, Bilster, and bless the community that we are part of. We ask now that you will use Elder Gooden, that he will bring the words that will not only encourage us, but allow us to have a better understanding of your love towards us as members of, of our respective families, but also those of us who have children and grandchildren, how we support and, and live with them during the age that we are ourselves living in. We now ask that you will continue to protect us, O oh Lord, continue to guide us, and we ask that whatever we fail to ask of you at this point in time, grant it unto us. And we would never not leave out those of our number who may not be able to be with us this today, whether through illness or through different circumstances. The same blessing that we are seeking for ourselves, we ask that you will bestow upon them. So hear these words now I ask, all these things in your most gracious and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Well, actually, good afternoon. Um, I hope you're all well. <clears throat> and um, taking hold of the blessings that we have on this Sabbath day, I've got a message to, to go through with you all. I want to say thank you to my wonderful wife for the introduction and also for the welcome to everyone. Um, and that video of the kids singing just brings back memories of when we were all able to be together in the church and we were able to sing um hopefully we'll be there again soon but again we're still here and whilst we're on zoom and we've got the opportunity to speak and to sing and to share our stories and experiences that we are having with god um i just want to say again good afternoon to you all happy sabbath those of you that are watching on zoom and those of you that are watching live on youtube god bless you all the title of my message today in line with the program for this month is what is the goal of raising a child in this digital age so without further ado i'm going to pray and then i'll go into the message that will talk about what our goal what my goal is in raising our son and just in in total, in raising a child in this digital age that we're living in. I'll invite you to pray with me right now. Dear Lord, I thank you for the privilege to come before you to pray, to seek your face, to ask for your help, to uh, for your Holy Spirit to move on the hearts of those that will listen to the message that I'll be speaking today. Father, I pray that as your Holy Spirit does move on the hearts of everybody who listens, that it will simply, he will he will bring to their remembrance things that they can do with you and how we can raise our children today, even though we're in a digital age. Father, after I finish praying, I'll go straight into the message and I, I'm looking forward to sharing these few words with everybody today. And ultimately, Lord, I want to say thank you because you have left us an example that we can follow in all areas of our life. At home in church, at work, wherever we may be, in raising the children, you have also left us an example there. So I say thank you. Let your name be lifted up as I speak. And let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in thinking about raising a child in this digital age, I was watching our son the other day, Israel, and he was playing about with my phone and he's tapping the numbers, he's tapping the applications. He loves looking at pictures, so he's looking at the pictures that are on there. And I thought when I was his age, we didn't have digital phones. I remember the dial phone that you'd have to put your finger in and pull it all the way around and you'd hear it make the ticking sound and it, it will make the ticking sound again as it was going back in reverse that I remember all of that. I remember the um, when those changed and then we had the touch button phones. Um, I remember the TVs. <laughs> there was actually a time for those of you that may be watching where people would put money in the TV and you could turn it and it would give you so much time for you to watch what was on, on the TV itself. Um, I remember when the aerial used to be on top of the TV box. Um, I remember those moments. I remember um, the, the um, like I've said, the telephones, the TVs, microwaves came into, into um, place. Things are different now. We're living in a time where I remember when my dad and my mom would put the records on the record player and you'd, if, if anybody bumped it, it would scratch or if there was a, a problem with the record, it would keep jumping over. I remember those times and now it's just so different because now if you, if you want to just listen to another track again, you just press the screen, you just tap the screen and it goes backwards 
or you just put your finger on the screen and hold it and then it starts to rewind. I remember when listening to a Walkman, the Sony Walkman, or you may have had a different make Walkman where you'd put the TDK tape. Um, if you got the TDK, you may have got a different version of tape and you'd put them in and to save the battery, you'd get a pen and because it would fit properly within the, the teeth of the, the um, wheel of the tape, you'd spin it around so that you could rewind or fast forward to the next song so that you wouldn't lose the battery. Horatio, you're laughing. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I remember those days. And um, we're, li we're just living in a completely different time. I remember when mobile phones used to be about this big and the, that wasn't including the antenna that would add another, you probably can't even fit on the screen. Big mobile phones. I remember when you'd put the numbers in and they'd be red on the screen, LCD. But we're in a different time now. And um, the screen, what we hold, our experience is just totally different. Just totally different. And especially during the time of COVID, um, the digital age has become all the more imposed on us as individuals and on our family members. Before I do go into some of the facts, some statistics that I want to share with you, I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Many of you may have heard of this before. If you haven't, we're going to all read it together anyway. Proverbs 22 and verse 6, and it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When he's old, he will not depart from it. The text actually means that train up a child in such a way so that when they are older, even if they do go away, they'll remember this, what you've taught them, and they will not depart from it. The thing is, how are we training up our children? How are we training them up? Regarding the digital age and what we've experienced over the past year, reports have actually shown that by the time of July 2020, that internet usage was up by 30%, and people were spending considerably more time um, then, and they are now, on the internet itself, than they were at the beginning of 2020. So imagine, that was in 2020, imagine what that usage of the internet is right now. I believe it's higher than 30%. A website by the name of Data Reportal highlighted the following points. Listen to these carefully. They've highlighted that more than half of the world now uses social media. In fact, even when looking for jobs now, people have been encouraged to make sure that they have what's called a LinkedIn profile so that CVs can be shared that way, or you can connect with people via the internet um, instead of having to do what we used to do, where you may print out your CV and go around to shops handing them out. They're now encouraging you in the professional realms, make sure you're on social media. Global TikTok has surged, uh, but they say the future growth may be more challenging. TikTok is immense. It's encouraging even the way that people shop. I'll give you an example. Just the other day I was in um, Aldi and I picked up this item and it was the last one that was left in the freezer. Picked it up, it was on the conveyor belt and the, the couple who were in front of me, the lady looked over at my, what I had and she said, ah, oh, that's what I came in to get. And then she ran off, left her husband at the till and he, he just started laughing, me and him started laughing. She said, yeah, she ran up, she got, she ran into the freezer, she came back and I said, you're lucky because there was a few, there's only a few left. Now I was getting this item because a friend of mine contact put a post up and he said, you know, have a try of these, these are really nice. She told, she said, oh yeah, we saw the advert on TikTok. I thought, no way, she said, we've been to so many shops and we can't buy this. And I thought, man, is this the impact social media is having on everybody around us now? They've also said Instagram has reached a big new audience milestone and it's continuing to grow. 
They found that digital habits formed during lockdown have endured despite the easing of restrictions. So what that means is the increased use of the connected devices is still continuing despite many countries starting to lift the lockdown restrictions that actually trigger that initial use in the first place. So what I'm trying to say is um, the surge in use of the digital device caused habits to form and those habits are continuing to grow on a daily, weekly, monthly basis even though the very reason why those habits started has started to be taken away. So people that have jumped on and have started using the digital sphere more because of lockdown, when lockdown eases, that doesn't mean that they'll stop using the digital thing that they're using, whether it's the phone or the computers that you're watching, iPads, or if you're an Android user, I won't say unfortunately, but I'll just say it. If you're an Android user, you're probably using the, the phones that you have or the tablets, etc. And because people are using them more, they've built habits that have caused them to continue using them. Um, one book says, welcome to what is called digital Babylon. Now, I say that, but that doesn't mean that everything that's out there is completely bad. We all live in what's called a spiritual Babylon. Um, there are things that are wrong in society and there are things which are okay in society. It's about how we use them. TVs can be used to watch documentaries, but they can also be used to watch things which will cause your relationship with God to be broken. The question is what habits are we allowing our children to form during this digital age? They say that seven in 10 internet users are still spending more time using mobile phones compared to pre-pandemic levels, um, while nearly half of us are still spending more time using laptops. So mobile phones, laptops, digital connections. More than eight in 10 people who were surveyed by the company called Ericsson reported that internet connected technologies have actually helped them during the pandemic. It's enabled them to support their children's education. 76% of people said that. So that 76% found that while their children were not able to go at school, etc., having a digital form, some screen, something that they could watch, actually helped those children and helped them to support the children's education. 74% said that it helped them during the pandemic to cause them to stay in touch with friends and family. Um, I experienced that last year on the Sabbaths. We were having meetings with the family, my mom, my brothers. We'd, we'd come on the screen and we'd be talking with each other. And it was interesting because my son would be going between the time that I'd be having with my family and also between the time that Frida, my, my wife was having with her family as well. And it was interesting, you know, there'd be He'd be hearing two different types of conversations. One conversation would be in Dutch. My conversations would be in English with the, the few hints of Pat, what that would be spoken every now and then. And it was digital. All of this was digital. 43% um, of people actually said that um, being on the digital sphere helped them improve their mental health and well being during the pandemic itself. And if you're not aware of this, I'm sure many of you are aware, but mental health has increased. It's catapulted during the time of COVID. Um, people have been experiencing a lot more depression and stress. And I believe it's partly to do with the fact that we have socially been disconnected. And there's a desire for us to all come back into social fellowship again. Now, a whopping 83% of the people who were surveyed said that the internet helped them cope with COVID-19 related lockdowns. That's a huge amount. That's a big percentage of people that were being surveyed regarding how they cope with the digital realm. And when I consider these statistics, I, I think, well, how do I translate this to today? 
am I supposed to get comfort from the internet? The other day there was a rant, there was an attack on the internet and it took down some of the leading web developers because the attacker didn't go to the didn't go to those main websites. They went to the cloud, the cloud, how can I put this in a way that everybody understands? They went to a central location that was allowing those websites to work. If they took down that central location, those websites connected will be taken away. And I sat down and I thought, if so many people have learned to get comfort from the internet during these times, what would happen if it's all taken away? Like right now, if somebody hacked Zoom, this sermon would stop, the live stream would stop. Would we still be able to take hold of a blessing on the Sabbath? I believe we can, as long as our focus is primarily on Jesus Christ, as Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. But we're not denying the fact that right now we're using the internet and a digital space to help us take hold of something that's there on the Sabbath as well. So how do I um, raise my son? How do we raise our children during this digital age? And whether we like it or not, it's not going to go away. The digital age is here to stay for a long time. So the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The CEV version says, teach your children right from wrong. And when they are grown, they will still do what is right. So the key point is about how do we teach our children? I want my training, our training of our son to guide him into a path so that when he is older, even if he wants to go away, from what we've taught him, that our training will be so solidly imprinted on his mind that he will still choose the right path. Now you might be thinking, how's that possible? Listen, let me tell you something. I was born in the church. I remember being blessed. Well, I don't, I don't remember it, but I know because the, the certificate shows that I had my baby blessing when I was at Hansworth Church. I remember going to the Sabbath schools and the, you know, those little moments that we had as kids when I was much, much, much younger. But we left, we left church for a long period of time. And there were certain principles that my mother and my father taught me that stayed with me for most of my life. So around the rebellious years of my time, I remember when I was working in a, in a hotel and I was doing silver service. That's the one where you put so many plates on your arms and then you've got the knives and the forks and you can use the spoon with the fork to do all of this stuff. I, I was trained to do that stuff and I enjoyed the time working in that, that area. It was a nice time, made some good friends. And, um, you know, I remember on our breaks, there was food that was made that we were able, that was made for us to eat, the staff. And I remember seeing these prawn cocktails. And I always, I'd sit there looking at them thinking, hmm, because it looked nice that the bowl that they were in was nice. And, you know, you had the, the creamy look of it and everything. And I always wondered, do they taste like the crisp? And I, I looked at it and I thought, man, I just want one just to see what does it taste like? What does prawn cocktail taste like? but there was something stopping me. And I'd hear the voice of my parents in the background, in the depths of my mind saying, we don't eat those foods. And I'd be like, man, but they won't know, they won't see. But then they linked what they told me to God. And I was always aware that God was watching everything I was doing anyway. But what I'm trying to get across was that there was a way that my parents trained me up. That when I was older, it still caused me to hold on to some of the right paths. Now, for those of you that may be watching and you, your eyes may have raised because I said prawn cocktail is not good. I just want to encourage you that as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in what the Bible outlines in the book of Leviticus regarding um, food laws. 
things that God said were clean and unclean. And um, we, you know, speaking of fish, God outlined that fish with scales was the only things from the sea that in his eyes was permissible during those times. And prawns don't have scales. And that's why my parents told me don't touch them. So, you know, as we continued through and I'm using this as a point to say that as I was older, big man in my own eyes, able to make my own decisions, there were still imprints of what my parents taught me on my mind. And I want that for my son. I want him in the midst of this digital age to still understand who God is from the teachings that I have the privilege to give him as a father and that my wife has the privilege to give him as his mother. In the book, Faith for Exiles by David Kinnaman and Mark Matlock, it's this book, excellent book if you can get a hold of it. They write about four kinds of exiles that exist in what they call digital Babylon. They say that there are one, there are the prodigals that makes up 22%. And the prodigals are ex-Christians. They do not identify as Christian, but they may have attended church at some time in their life experience. So they're prodigals, they're, they're, they've gone away. Then they've said 30% of young Christians, of young people, are called nomads. Their class is being unchurched or identify as Christian, but have not attended church during the last month, with a vast majority not being involved for the last six months plus. Now, this book was written before the pandemic, so what they're saying was to do with the time when we were able to be face-to-face -face in church, but can you imagine what that percentage would be now, in that all of our services have been online, and people have found it a lot more easier to simply not go or attend digital church. So the 30% at that time were nomads. They say 38% of people were habitual churchgoers. In other words, they describe themselves as Christians. They have attended church, but they have no real foundational core. They have no foundational core beliefs, which are linked with being intentional about their faith. In other words, they're simply not engaged as a disciple, but they will go to church because they're told to do so. And then you've got the smallest percent, which is called resilient disciples. Um, this makes up about 10%. And these are young people who have decided to follow Christ with their whole life. And they've made up their mind that they are going to be solid disciples. They attend church regularly. They trust firmly the authority of the Bible, and they are very committed to Jesus. They also desire to transform the broader society as an outcome of their faith. Now, as we look at the, those four groups, the prodigals, the nomads, the habitual churchgoers, and the resilient disciples, the question I have to ask in the context of this message is, which one would I want my son to be? Which one would you want your child to be? I want my son, we want our son to be a resilient disciple. I believe that this is the goal of raising a child in this digital age. I want our goal in raising our child in this digital age is for him to be a resilient disciple. Someone who's holding on to God. Somebody who wants to have a relationship with God, not just because he's been taught this, but because he wants to know God for himself. Now, as a parent, as parents, we do our best. We, we want our son to have the opportunity to ask questions. I want him to have the power to say no so that I can talk to him and reason with him. I want him to be able to reason with me. I want him to be able to be open with me and ask me questions. God says that I can go and reason with him. So I want my son to be able to come and reason with us. But here are some key points that I want us to consider about what makes a resilient disciple. A resilient disciple is somebody who has a personal experience with Jesus that goes beyond the time frame of Sabbath hours. 
let's not deny it. The Sabbath is a sanctuary of time. We love the time that we have together from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. We have this time which is called Sabbath. It's holy time. It's time sanctified and set apart so that when I enter into that time, I'm taking hold of a blessing that God has put on this day. But my personal experience with Jesus needs to go beyond those times. It needs to be an experience which goes through the whole week. And the Sabbath is just a moment where I get to have a hundred percent time with God. So a resilient disciple is somebody who has a personal experience with Jesus that goes beyond just the time frame of the Sabbath. They should have a relationship with God that brings joy and contentment. It should be a life which is shaped by his or her experience with Christ. I've often said the worst experience you can have is the experience of never experiencing Christ. Because ultimately it is an experience. It's just a sad one. It's an experience. Experience. You're not engaging with Christ. You're not learning of him. I want our son to have a life shaped by his experience with Christ. A relationship with Jesus needs to impact the way that he or whichever child you have, a son or a daughter, that a relationship with Jesus should impact the way that he or she lives. A resilient disciple will, will worship not as an event. He, will, he or she will have a worship that is a lifestyle. It's not based on a, a special day that's being promoted for them that's going to happen in church. No, their worship experience is something to be from the morning right through to the afternoon. Worship is a lifestyle. Listen, our son, he loves listening to his music. His, we, we've got so many different Christian albums and songs for him. And there are times he's just listening his walking around with the Bluetooth speaker. Yeah, we didn't have those in my days. The speaker was limited to the system and couldn't be pulled anyway because it was too big anyway. But there's these little speakers now, Bluetooth digitally connected. And you know, he's walking around with this speaker to the point where I've heard so much of these songs that when I'm shopping or walking around, I'm whistling and singing, humming some of these songs in my mind. And I'm like, where did that come from? It's because I've been listening to it all day long as he's been listening to it. So I find that raising a child is also a two-way experience as we're teaching him about Christ and he enjoys those moments with Christ and he enjoys the music that he's listening to. It also reflects and has an impact back on me where the music he's listening to, just as an example, is what's going on in my mind as I'm walking about my daily business. Worship a lifestyle, not just an event. I want our children to understand the three habits of grace, which should be reading the Bible, praying, and sharing the faith with others. These are good habits that we should be building in our relationship. These are goals that we need them to have regularly attending church and participating in the movement that we are as Seventh-day Adventists. Can't wait for us to be back face to face again, but we have to realize that we're still Seventh-day Adventists at home. We're still Seventh-day Adventists when we may go for a walk today, late run in the streets. People may wonder, you know, why don't you go shopping on this day? Why don't you go and do certain things? It's because the Sabbath is still the Sabbath, whether it's on digital platforms or we're face to face, the Sabbath time doesn't change. Regularly attending church and participating in the movement. We want our son to do that. And one of the most important points of him being a resilient disciple is that I want him to understand his identity in Christ and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with your whole heart. 
Jesus Christ said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. I want our son, as we're raising him, to look for God with his whole heart. I want him to know that he's connected with God, not just because his name is Israel, but because he is part of God's people. The other day we were going through a devotional and we were reading with him in his children's devotional about the nation of Israel. And you know, his face is smiling as he's hearing his name. And we also encouraged him to know that Israel was not just a name for Jacob. It's also a name for a whole nation of people, a name that means you overcome with God. And we want him to know that as he's being raised, he can overcome in this world as long as he focuses on God. So I want him to search for his identity. I want him to know who he is in Christ. It won't always be easy for him. It won't always be easy for us as parents as we're raising the children and we see that they strive between making the wrong and the right decisions and you want to make them make the right decisions, but we can't force them. It has to be something that they do willingly of themselves. The search for identity as a resilient disciple is determined by where the children or the youth are taught to look. We want our son to understand that his identity is found in his creator, God. Yet there is also a cultural makeup within him that he can't deny. I sit here as a Christian, but I also sit here as a man who is Jamaican and English. My parents are from Jamaica, both of them. I was born in England. I can't deny that. My son has a mix. From me, he gets the Jamaican and the, the British side. And from my wife, he gets the Surinamese and the Dutch side. And he's a mix, four cultures in one. And, and he, he can't get away from that. I don't want him to. I want him to know who he is. I want him to know this. So he, he will see culturally who we are at the dinner table. He'll taste that culture at the dinner table. He hears the cultures when he hears his parents speak to him. I speak to him in, in English and a bit of broken patway every now and then. And my wife speaks to him in Dutch and in English when, when, when needed, mainly in Dutch. He sees it when he looks at the family members. He'll see the cultures. He'll smell it when he visits the family homes and the countries. And he sees the food and, and the, the drinks and everything else that we enjoy culturally as a people. At the dinner table, I want him to know that in the midst of who and what his makeup is, God is still engaged with him. And it works like this. At the dinner table, he hears and says the gracing of our food. God is there. And it's a blessing when, when we're around the table and we'll say, let's pray for our food. And he'll put his little hands together and he'll say, thank you, Jesus, for this food, amen. And it touches my heart when I see him, no matter how big or small the food may be, whether it's just a small little pack of crisps or whether it's something else, I, it warms my heart when I hear him gracing the food. It lets me know that something has stuck, something's there, it's working. At the dinner table, he should see God. When we speak, he should hear the humility of a Christian. So when I'm talking to my wife or when she's talking to me or when we're talking to others, he is learning, he's observing, and he should be seeing a Christian conduct in our conversation. When he sees us, he should see the attitude and the walk of a Christian, the way that I carry myself and live my life amongst the world should reveal God to him. When we are around family, even the family members who don't believe God, I hope that in the midst, he will see God. And he will grow up to be a witness to those family members who may not be Christians yet. When he visits a country, 
whether it's Holland or Suriname or Jamaica or a city somewhere in England. I want him to see that in these lands, God made it. And in these essences, I want him to grow up. I believe we want our children to be raised in this digital age, understanding that they can be Christians. They can be resilient disciples. We can make God central to everything that we are as a people. Everything that we are as a people. As our son starting to ask us questions, questions and ask us why we do and we don't do certain things, I find it a privilege to be challenged to give him an answer. I don't want him to grow up and just hear from me, we do this just because we do it and you do it because I'm your parent. I want him to be able to ask us a question and we sit down with him and reason with him. So he leaves understanding why. Has he asked why do we keep the Sabbath? Yes. Why can he not do certain things on this day? Yes. He's asked those questions and it's been a privilege to sit down with him and explain this is why we can and we cannot do certain things on this day. And then to hear him say, oh, okay. And then we'll wait for another moment when he'll ask another question. I love the challenge. And in raising our children, we should love the challenge. To be challenged. So that we can bring close to Christ. Remember, we are only raising children who God has gifted to us for his kingdom. We are ultimately raising God's children. Yet outside of God, there are many places that the youth and the children can go to to get their understanding and identity. Many will go to brands and clothes, celebrities, sports, people who they admire, work, and at times even their sexuality. These are things that the world are using and are being gauged to raise the children of today. Now, I'm not saying that the child should be kept away from all of those things, but raise the child up so he can make, so that he or she can make the right decisions for Christ in the midst of a world that says there is no God. I'm not saying that we dress them and clothe them in things that makes them so separate from society that nobody knows how to approach them. No, go along with the times, the times that we live in. Dress appropriately. But what I would say is do so in the spirit of Christ. The goal of raising a child should be for them to reflect the character of God. And that will mean that they need the freedom to ask, who am I? How should I live? Am I loved? Does anybody care about me? Does my life even matter? Am I made for something? Can I make a difference? What really matters in this world? Those are questions that children should be allowed to ask and they should know that they have the ability to leave a good, godly legacy in this world behind them. There are people who have left terrible legacies. We think of Hitler, Kaiser Wilhelm, Nero, these men that we can read in history who left terrible legacies. There are people who have left Good legacies in life that we can read about. Kings, queens, and patriarchs, and prophets. What legacy are we leaving? I want my son to know that he can grow up to be a great person. The people who have left great legacies and bad legacies, they were also babies too. They were allowed to make decisions too. I just believe that they were allowed and were guided in wrong directions, and we can make right what has been wronged today. We can make the difference today. I want my son to leave a legacy. I want him to see something that I've left behind, that God has called me to do. Just this week, a friend of mine messaged me and she said that her children 
are going to be getting baptized and the pastor's going to be meeting with them to study with them. Yet that friend of mine, I met in a library in, in college, gave Bible studies, printed out the Seventh-day Adventist fundamentals for her, and she became an Adventist. And she told me, Craig, my children getting baptized is part of your legacy. Humbled me. Still humbles me to know that I played a part in having her come to Christ. She's now bringing her children to Christ with her husband. And I'm praising God for that. And I want my son to know that he can leave a legacy. In our neighborhood, we leave a legacy. In his schooling, he will leave a legacy. In his college, where if he goes, wherever he goes, or a university, he will leave a legacy. In his workplaces, he will leave a legacy. Where what he does to make an impact on society, as long as somebody remembers that he has done something for God, he's leaving a legacy. Something that he will be able to look back on and say, God be praised. God was lifted up in this place. And that's what a resilient disciple will do. And sometimes that will mean that our children will have to be taught that if society is telling them to go against God, that they must go against that stream and stay focused on God. Swimming upstream is not easy, but sometimes it has to be done. Not in a negative way. But put God first. And as the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Are there dangers with the digital screens? Yes, there are. We're, counts, we're told, and you can search this up, we shouldn't be allowing our children to be on the screens for more, I think, at some ages, very young ages, they shouldn't be on the screens for more than half an hour a day. Some cases, 15, 10 to 15 minutes a day. We've done our best to make sure that our son was not on the screen too much. There will be times when we may watch a bit of a documentary together and everything else and we'll set specific times, but we don't want him to be damaged by that. Can the digital screen damage your child? Yes, it can. So be diligent and study and understand the physics and the, the way that the brain works, the way that the neurons and synaptic pathways are formed. You are teaching your children new habits every single day. Everything they touch, the smells, everything that they experience is forming synaptic pathways in the brain. And the more that they experience it, is the stronger that those pathways become. So do we want our child to be on the screen every day, all day long? No way. It's not even good for teenagers. So there needs to be balance. Understand the development of the child. As they grow between the ages of one to three, very important age. Obedience can be taught during those ages. Now, I'm not talking about the obedience where you're telling the child up. I'm talking about obedience where God said, teach your children the Lord, teach them to love me. If our child can pray and he's been praying for a few years now, if he knows how to pray now, then that's proved that point. Between the ages of one to three, it is possible. If they can be taught to go on a balanced bike at two, or two and a half, or three, they can be taught to pray. They can be taught to understand who God is. Then between the ages of three to seven, that's character formation. By the age of seven, their character, their thoughts, feelings, some of these things are combined by that time, by the age of seven. There's a lot of work to do during that time period. Teaching things such as instant obedience, um, uh, honoring parents, understanding the difference between right and wrong, giving the opportunity to know how to differentiate between good and bad, helping them in those moments. And then eight onwards is about developing people for society. A young child who will become a teenager and an adult is to be trained to go forward. And they must be allowed to be an individual, to be who they are, to speak the way that they will speak and to say things that allow them to be who they are. And in closing, I just want to share 
some scriptures with you that I hope will encourage you. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. As we train our children to be resilient disciples, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Teach the children to love God and to love the neighbors. Teach them that love can be vertical and horizontal. John 10 verse 10, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said that he came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Teach your child that an abundant life is gained as a Christian. Ephesians 2 verse 10, God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us new people so that we would spend our lives doing the good things he had already planned for us to do. Understand and know that your child fits into a plan that God had for him or her before you had them. We just want to make sure that as a resilient disciple, we're helping them fit into the plan correctly. Matthew 19 verse 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went their way, went his way. Allow Jesus to lay his hands on the children through your ministry in the home. Fathers are to be the priest of the home while the mother is to be the queen. And the mother is to be, in cases as teaching, the head teacher, as it is outlined. I've told my wife, I am simply a co-teacher with her. She's the head teacher. But I am the priest of the home. And I have to fulfill my duty there properly too. So we work as a team, collectively. And it's a privilege to see. Because we're both raising up a resilient disciple. And lastly, train up a child in the way he shall go. Even so that even when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. So in closing, train up the children in the way that they shall go. Train them to be resilient disciples. This is the goal of raising children in the digital age. Yes, they may not have the TDK tapes and the pencils to rewind. They may not ever have to put a pound in the telephone box. They may not have a pager where they have to wait for those moments to make a phone call. They may not have the record players and the, the TVs and the VHS players. But what they do have is the same God that we have access to, that our parents had access to, that they are invited to have access to as well. Let's raise resilient disciples in this digital age. In closing, my only appeal comes from the experience I had from my mother and my father. My parents didn't condemn me and break me down when I made bad decisions as I was growing up. Instead, what they often did is offered a better opportunity. They guided me in paths, and at times I went the wayward. I, I was wayward. I'd go off track. But when I came back, when I'd come to talk to them and reason with them, they always had an ear open to listen and were always willing to help me. Let's apply the same principles in raising our children. The same type of principles that my mom, my father did for me the same principles that God has outlined in his Bible, in the book of Isaiah, where he says his ear is never too heavy to hear you and his arm is never too short to save. Let's apply that principle to the children and I'm sure it will help them in being Christians and resilient disciples for Christ as we raise them up for God. So in closing, I'm just going to say a word of prayer and plead with us, raise resilient disciples let's pray dear lord i thank you for the opportunity to have spoken this message i pray that as these words the scriptures the thoughts are expressed 
that each of us as individuals will apply those principles to our lives, those principles to our homes, those principles will flow out from our homes into the communities and into the churches. Help us to raise resilient disciples who will one day be citizens in the physical city of heaven, the new Jerusalem. They'll walk the streets of the new earth and we'll all call you Father. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.